Welcome. We are so excited to be able to present our Saturday festival, and um, we hope to continue this in the future. I'm Jean Ahrens, and I am a member of the Savannah Book Festival board, and usually we just go right to introducing our author, but I did want to talk to you about a few things. Um, inflation has affected all of us, and of course it's affected the Savannah Book Festival. 90% uh, of our income comes from sponsors and donations. We have been so proud to be able to present Savannah Saturday Festival for free to the public, and I know you've all been wonderful supporters. Um, this year, our expenses have risen, but our budget has stayed the same. So we decided to maybe ask again for your support. We always have yellow buckets that go around where we ask for donations, but we decided this year that maybe we could even make it a little bit easier. So if you go to the back of your program, you can see the QR code that you could donate. We now have a Venmo account. So I'm urging you to help us remain a free public Saturday for the book festival and your donations would be so appreciated. Thank you for coming, enjoy the day, and now we would love to present our speaker. Not the speaker, the introducer. Good morning, fellow book lovers. I'm Sheila Grossman, and um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second hour of the 16th Annual Savannah Book Festival Saturday program. Um, this year's festival is presented by the Philip E. and Nancy B. Beekman Foundation, David and Nancy Sintrin, Robert Faircloth, the Courtney Knight Gaines Foundation, and the Gerald D. and Helen M. Stevens Foundation, with a special thanks to a grant from Georgia Humanities. We are especially grateful to Joe Hart and Marie Park for sponsoring the Savannah Theater this morning. We'd also like to welcome our generous sponsors and literati members, as Jeannie was telling you. It's really through your support and hopefully everyone's support um, that we are able to make festival events this Saturday free and open to the public. 90% of our revenue comes from the donors and literati, and we really thank you. This year's festival is full of great events and authors, and since we don't want you to miss anything, um, we encourage you to download the Savannah Book Festival app on your phone. It can keep you up to date on all the latest information. If you need more information about downloading the app, it also is on the back of your program. Before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. Stacy Willingham will be signing festival purchase copies of her book in Telfair Square immediately following the presentation. If you're planning to stay for the next order, Joe Scalzi, um, usually we ask everybody to move up front so it's easier to keep track, but I've been told that in this venue it's fine. So if you're staying, you don't have to change seats. Um, please take this moment to make sure that your cell phones are off and we ask that you not take any flash photography. On the back of your program, you'll find a QR code for a survey and we would really appreciate it during the day if you'll take the time to share your opinion. The survey helps with continuous improvement and measures the impact our festival has on the city of Savannah. Your response is important to the funding of the arts in our community. Um, we, ha we will have the opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the talk. Um, when we get to that portion, we ask that you raise your hand. There will be um, ushers who have microphones that will either be held or passed to you. Um, so please wait for the microphone. We'd like everybody to be able to hear your question. Stacy Willingham is here with us today, courtesy of the University of Georgia Libraries, as well as David and Roberta Irwin. Stacy Willingham worked as a copywriter and a brand strategist for various marketing agencies before deciding to write fiction full time. She earned her BA in magazine journalism from the University of Georgia and her MFA in writing from the Savannah College of Art and Design. 
She currently lives in Charleston, South Carolina with her husband, Britt, and Labradoodle, Mako. Please help me give a warm Savannah welcome to Stacey Willingham. Hello. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Thank you so much. Um, hi, guys. Thank you so much for coming out today. I am Stacy Willingham. Um, first and foremost, I just want to, again, thank the Savannah Book Festival for inviting me here. I, uh, I absolutely love Savannah. It's a city close to my heart for a variety of reasons, which I'll actually get into today. Um, and thank you all so much for coming out on this uh, very cold but beautiful Saturday morning. So, um, as mentioned, I'm Stacy. I'm the author of uh, Flicker in the Dark, which was my debut. It came out uh, last January. And now my latest book, All the Dangerous Things, which was just published uh, about six weeks ago in the book I'll be focusing on the most today. And um, since we're in Savannah, of all places, the Savannah Book Festival, I'm actually going to do something that I don't typically do during my presentations, and that's read a short passage from my book. But um, I promise it's a short passage. You're not going to be sitting here for too long listening to me read. But I thought it would kind of perfectly set the tone for what I'm about to talk about. And um, you'll, you'll pretty quickly realize why. So this is uh, a few paragraphs from the beginning of Chapter 9 of All the Dangerous Things. I hop into my car and drive downtown, gliding into a parking spot along Chippewa Square. The early March air is crisp and clean, and I decide to stroll without direction until the vigil starts walking past the fragrant azalea gardens in a tarnished brass statue of General James Oglethorpe looking down on us all. Walking the squares always gives me a sense of peace, a sense of calm, which I know I'll need tonight. Eventually, I find myself on Abercorn, on the outskirts of Colonial Park Cemetery, staring past the giant stone archway topped with that big bronze bird. There are over 10,000 headstones in that cemetery, a useless piece of tri trivia I learned on my first day at the Grit. I look to the left. The office, my old office, is only a few blocks north, closer to the river. I used to be able to see it every day, the Savannah River, winding in the distance through those gorgeous floor-to-ceiling windows as I sat at my desk, tapping out articles. Do you believe in ghosts? I remember looking up at Casey, my tour guide and mentor. She was a reporter, too, two years my senior and tasked with greeting me at the front door on my first day at work. Sorry, what? I asked. Ghosts, she repeated. Savannah's supposed to be haunted. The most haunted city in America, in fact. Even this very building has a ghost story or two. I looked around, the modern office looking the exact opposite of a haunted house. Sometimes people say they can feel a cold little shiver go down the back of their spine when they're the last ones to leave at night. Oh, I laughed, unsure if she was kidding. Judging by her expression, she wasn't. No, actually, I don't think I do. And that was the truth, sort of. I didn't believe in ghosts, not the traditional kind anyway, the kind they show in the movies, but my mother used to tell us stories about something else, something a little harder to explain. She used to tell us that all those little experiences you could never quite put your finger on, a tickle on the back of your neck, a nagging feeling that you were forgetting something, that creeping sense of deja vu that flared up when you visited someplace new, were other souls trying to send you a message. Living or dead, it didn't matter, just other souls. Well, you're about to, Casey grinned. Out that window is Colonial Park Cemetery home to over 10,000 headstones, but that's not even the creepiest part. You know Abercorn Street, the sidewalk you walk down to get to Oglethorpe? I nodded, tucking a rogue strand of hair behind my ear and letting my fingertips rust, rest on that familiar patch of skin. Well, that's technically part of the cemetery too, even though it isn't gated. There are bodies buried beneath the sidewalk, the street, hundreds of bodies that people just walk over every single day. So there's a fun little piece of Savannah trivia, which is, um, which is actually true. So right now, you are sitting pretty much right in the middle of that scene from my book. Colonial Park Cemetery is 0.1 miles from here. Uh, you probably walked that very path that Isabel walked to get to work to get to this very theater. And uh, the sidewalk is, in fact, paved over unmarked sections of the cemetery itself. So All the Dangerous Things, uh, for those of you who have not read it yet, tells the story of Isabel Drake, who wakes up one morning, a young mother who wakes up one morning to find herself living in her own worst nightmare. Her toddler son, Mason, has disappeared out of his crib in the middle of the night while she was asleep in the next room. Now, like any mother, Isabel decides to dedicate her life to trying to find him, doing everything in her power, including traveling to true crime conferences uh, around the country in an attempt to keep his case alive. But one year later, the case is still cold. 
Mason is still missing, there are no leads, and Isabel has developed a pretty severe case of insomnia that leaves her questioning everything, including her own memories and mine. Now, it's funny to me, stories, my stories that I write, they never really come to me from one singular moment of inspiration or like an aha moment, but instead a handful of seemingly unrelated little seeds that over time kind of intertwine and grow together in my mind and sprout into this one big idea. So today I thought I'd tell you the four little seeds of inspiration that came to me over the course of several years um, that ultimately became this single book, All the Dangerous Things, including why the city of Savannah um, was chosen as its setting. So in 2019, I was still writing my first book, A Flicker in the Dark. I hadn't even finished it yet. I didn't have an agent yet. So I was focusing on wrapping that up, trying to figure out how I was gonna get it represented to see if I could ever get it published. So I wasn't even thinking about what I was gonna write next. Uh, a second book wasn't even on my mind, but I had read an article in the Washington Post that really, really stuck with me. And it was an article about a man at a true crime convention. The uh, journalist who wrote the article basically followed him around for three straight days and told his story. But what made it really interesting is that man was not there as just your typical attendee. He was there because his sister had been murdered in a string of unsolved murders in the 80s called the Colonial Parkway murders. And at the time that article was written, um, it had been, the case had been cold for about 35 years. And that article was fascinating, but also heartbreaking to me because it did a really good job juxtaposing the attendees of these true crime conventions who are essentially there for entertainment and the family members of various victims, the ones who got up on stage, who were there for news coverage and networking. And it highlighted this really delicate dance that these family members had to perform in order to come across as approachable and friendly while they're recounting the worst moment of their lives in front of a live audience. And the way they presented their loved one's murder, it, they, were, they were talking about it like it was something worthy of a plot line that could get them on Dateline or maybe their own podcast. And it was this moral dilemma that this man was facing knowing that you know, he was spending three full days schmoozing with people who kind of viewed his loved one's death as, as a story, an interesting story to consume. But at the same time, he knew that the coverage he could potentially get from being at that conference might be worth it. It could, it could lead to a lead, it could lead to a break, it could lead to new evidence. Um, but these people that he was dealing with, the attendees, um, they cared, you know, they listened to him talk, they were crying in the audience, but they got to just leave the conference and go home to their families and their lives, and he didn't have that luxury. So like many of you, I'm, I assume if you're here, you're interested in thrillers, and most people who are interested in thrillers are also interested in true crime. So like many of you, I do consume true crime. I, I watch the documentaries, I listen to the podcasts, and I have always struggled with the morality of it all. Is it moral to consume stories like that that are based on people's real lives, real tragedies? But I had never really thought about the morality that people who have been personally affected by a terrible crime, they have those struggles as well and how they should deal with it. So I kept chewing over how hard that must be, not only to have gone through such a terrible, heart-wrenching thing, but to also have to navigate this thin line between raising awareness without feeling exploitative, of boosting public interest without alienating law enforcement. Because a lot of times, in order to get on these shows or podcasts, you have to be willing to give them something new, give them something the public hasn't heard yet. And if you're kind of slipping them a piece of evidence that law enforcement doesn't want made public, maybe they'll, they'll kind of turn up their nose and stop, stop giving your case so much attention. Um, trying to do everything in your power to seek justice for your loved one without tipping into the territory of obsession and letting it consume your own life. So, that was the very first seed, that article I read, as well as what eventually became the very first chapter of All the Dangerous Things. My main character, Isabel, is introduced to us at a true crime convention where she's doing everything in her power to find her missing son. We see her sitting backstage, kind of trying to hype herself up, hearing the cheers of the audience and the claps and the murmurs, and when she walks out on stage, they're filming her, you know, the beady little eyes of everyone's iPhones watching her, and 
She's talking about the worst moment of her life, the moment she realized her son is missing, her 18-month-old son is missing, but she's pausing at just the right moments for dramatic emphasis. She's saying these manufactured lines that she knows will make good poll quotes in the newspaper the next day. Um, and and I, I really just wanted to dig into how that would feel. Now the second seed came about six months later when I was having a hard time falling asleep. So I would not call myself an insomniac per se, but I've always, it's always taken me a while to nod off. I'm an overthinker, I tend to ruminate, I you know, think about every embarrassing thing I've ever done since the age of 12, and it keeps me awake. Um, but my husband, of course, is the exact opposite. He falls asleep in seconds, a matter of seconds, and he dips into a sleep so deep that sometimes he starts to talk. And it's usually pretty benign. He'll mumble just things about work or random words that don't really make sense. But um, on this particular night, it got a little creepy. And I'm going to use this opportunity to publicly embarrass him for the millionth time. He's actually here. And, uh, <laughs> and he lets me tell this story to audiences all over the country for the sole purpose of selling a few books. He's a great guy. And despite what you're about to learn about him, he's totally harmless, I swear. But I had been awake for, for about an hour, um, just kind of tossing and turning and thinking, and all of a sudden, I feel my husband sit up in bed right beside me and reach over to the side and turn on the bedside lamp. And I look over at him, and his eyes are wide open. He's staring straight ahead, and I'm like, what, do you, what is it? Like, what are you doing? Why'd you turn on the light? And he turns to look at me, and he says, she needs to see where she's going. Yeah, <laughs> just <laughs> let that sink in for a second. So... Of course, I'm like, excuse me, what? Like, who, who needs to see where she's going? Is she in the room with us? Like, is she a nice ghost? Like, why, what does she want? So I'm, I'm shaking him awake, and I start slapping his arm. You know, the, the old saying is you're not supposed to wake a sleepwalker, but at this point, I don't care. He needs to wake up. And when he finally wakes up, he has no idea what I'm talking about. He has no clue who that woman is, what he was dreaming about, why he turned on the light. And so, uh, naturally, he falls asleep in about five seconds, and... I'm more awake than ever, <laughs> laying right next to him with my eyes wide open with this really strange mental image of um, this woman in a nightgown walking around in the middle of the night in the dark who for some reason or another needs to see where she's going. I didn't know who she was or what she was doing, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. And that image paired with what I had just seen him do, the things he had did and said in his sleep, really got me thinking about sleepwalking and how terrifying it can be if you really think about it, not just for the person witnessing it, but also for the person doing it. Because slipping into a deep sleep like that, a sleep so deep that you say and do things that you don't remember doing when you wake up, that must be really unsettling, right? Of, of losing control of your own body, of waking up in strange places without any recollection of how you got there, of seeing items in your house moved around in the morning and not knowing if you moved them or maybe if someone else was in your house and moved them. And then I started thinking about insomnia. What I kind of struggle with is essentially the exact opposite of that. A deep sleep makes you lose control of your own body, but an inability to sleep, if it gets bad enough, makes you lose control of your own mind. Because if you go a day, a week, a month, or in Isabel's case, an entire year without decent, solid sleep, everything would get incredibly murky. You would, you know, you wouldn't be able to trust your own instincts, your own senses, your own memories. You become forgetful and alienated. So it was this concept of if you're an insomniac, you can't trust yourself when you're awake. But if you're a sleepwalker, you can't trust yourself when you're asleep. And which would be more terrifying, losing control of your mind or losing control of your body? And what would happen if one person lost control of both? So that was the second seed. Isabel has a history of sleepwalking, but ever since her son disappeared, she's been suffering from insomnia instead. So she has experienced both. She knows the unsettling feeling of coming to in strange places or of not knowing what she was doing just seconds before or of waking up to find her little sister staring at her from the hallway, this terrified look on her face because she's been wandering the halls at night. <clears throat> but she also knows what it's like to feel reality slipping straight through her fingers because she is so perpetually tired because she's been awake for so long she just can't think straight both before and after her son's disappearance because I'm sure as any new mother could probably emphasize 
insomnia is very real when you have a young child at home. So that revelation was, was really exciting to me because now I had this idea of this mother searching for her son, but I had this element of sleep that I also wanted to incorporate into the story. So I did, I did so much research on sleepwalking and sleep deprivation, and I learned some really incredible but also terrifying things. So for example, the CIA is actually authorized to keep prisoners awake for up to 120 hours, which is about a week. So one week, they're allowed to keep them awake. After a week, it's considered cruel and unusual punishment. But after 48 hours, the prisoners start to hallucinate. They become really irritable and suggestive. Uh, they suffer from memory loss, depression, anxiety, uh, decreased brain function, and a variety of psychiatric disorders that actually were were learned to stay with them even after the sleep deprivation ended. So it's kind of a permanent uh, alteration in their brain. Um, I also learned that sleepwalking in adolescence is actually a lot more common than you would think. I'm sure there are probably some sleepwalkers in the room right now. About a third of children sleepwalk at some point, and it's not, it's not considered uncommon. It's actually, um, it's actually fairly normal, but some of them never grow out of it. They go on to become sleepwalkers uh, as adults, and they can have they can do all kinds of things when they're asleep. They can have entire conversations and not remember them in the morning. They can change their clothes, let themselves out of their house. A lot of times they try to go about their regular routines. They'll shave their necks, they'll get in their car, they'll try to drive to work, all while they are fast asleep. Now, the third seed is a little bit harder to get into without giving away any spoilers, because it's a major, major plot point of the book. Um, so I'm going to keep this one vague, but I'm going to mention it um, in, in some fuzzy terms. But I do talk about it in, in pretty great detail um, in an author's note at the back of the book that uh, if you do choose to read the book, I would really encourage you to read the author's note when you are done because it contains every spoiler possible. So if you skip ahead and read it first, the book will not be enjoyable. Um, but it has to do with motherhood and all the different ways society treats women. So I, I'm at the age now, and when I started writing this book, I was at the age where the last five to ten years of my life has really been dominated by my friends and my family members and my colleagues making up their minds about kids, right? When you're kind of in your, your late 20s, your early 30s, that's very top of mind. And we all had different opinions about it. Some of us wanted kids immediately. Some of us wanted to wait. Some of us uh, wanted to be stay-at-home moms. Some of us wanted to work full-time. Some of us didn't even want kids at all. And it's an incredibly personal decision, but it felt like, it seemed like in the eyes of society, it was, whatever decision was chosen was the wrong decision, uh, according to someone else. Everyone had an opinion about it. No one was afraid to share that opinion. And it made me realize that judgment towards women, and mothers especially, emanates from everywhere. And the more we absorb it, the more we internalize it. Even the best mothers suffer from mom guilt, right? That feeling deep down that everything that goes wrong is somehow your fault. And I started thinking about how much worse those feelings would be if something very public and very terrible happened to your child. And all of a sudden, you're thrust under the world's microscope and everyone gets to point at you and say, what a bad mom. And Isabel deals with that over and over and over again from everyone in her life, from um, the public, the attendees at her conferences, strangers on the internet who are leaving her comments, the police, uh, friends, family members, even her own husband. Um, and that was something that I wanted to explore in great detail. So finally, um, the city of Savannah was the last seed that in my opinion really ties this whole story together. Uh, I'm not from Savannah. I'm actually from Charleston, South Carolina, about two hours from here. They're, they're very similar cities, but also very different in their own rights. But I do have family here. My husband was born and raised here. My, my in-laws live here. And after 10 years of visiting this city and just kind of falling in love with it, I realized this is a story about a woman who is incredibly haunted. She's haunted by the loss of her son. She's haunted by mysteries of her past. She's haunted by decisions she regrets, memories she doesn't fully understand, and what better place to put a woman so haunted than in a place that is actually haunted, in a place where memories and spirits kind of hover over everything, where cemeteries and just rich history is on, on every block. 
Um, so as I read in the beginning of this talk, the book is, is full of descriptions like that, descriptions of Savannah, um, but also Beaufort, which is another um, coastal town about an hour from here. And I think it really showcases the gothic beauty of these like cobblestone corridors and Spanish moss and wrought iron fences and crumbling old tombstones. But at the same time, it's beautiful, yes, but if you look at it in just the right light or in Isabel's case in the dark, since she's always awake in the middle of the night, there can be something really eerie and unsettling about it too. Um, so those were the four seeds of A Flicker in the Dark that came to me again over the course of about three years. Uh, two and a half, three years, and they all came together in this one, this one book that is um, about a mother of a missing son who is doing everything in her power to find him, uh, but she feels like she's up against everyone, including herself at times. Um, but to me, it's about a lot more than that. It's about true crime, the true crime craze, and the morality of consuming stories like that. It's about womanhood and motherhood and sisterhood and sleep psychology and um, and I'm really I'm really proud of this story so I hope you guys I hope you guys enjoy it and that's what I have so. and I, I believe we have plenty of time for questions so yeah um, just hold on one second they're getting the microphone we have question back here to start us off. Thank you so much. I never before had thought about the morality of true crime, so like, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, question for you though, when did you first start writing and what was it? Was it like Babysitter's Club fanfic or like something truly literary? And when did you realize that could be something, like you could be a real writer, a real author? Yeah. Um, so I have been writing pretty much my whole life. Uh, my, my older sister and I used to write little short stories and screenplays together when we were kids. And funny enough, it was not, it was not Babysitter's Club fan fiction and it was not literary. It was like really dark horror stuff <laughs> when I was like eight years old. So I've always been into this. I don't know why. Well, actually I do know why. My parents, uh, who are also here, raised me on old classics like Columbo and Alfred Hitchcock and The Twilight Zone. So I have always loved a mystery. Um, so yeah, I've been dabbling in that my entire life. But in terms of when I thought I might be able to become a writer, as soon as I graduated college, I majored in magazine journalism. I wanted to be a journalist, um, but I had a, I had a pretty hard time finding a job. And so I was doing freelance journalism on the side, uh, to kind of make some extra money and, and try to get, um, a portfolio of bylines. And I noticed that all of my articles I would get really, really descriptive and go really, really deep in like the character development of the people I was interviewing. And my editors were like, this is cool, but it's like five times too long. So they would cut it all and I would never like the article that was published because it was way too like bare bones for me. So I was like, okay, I think journalism's not for me. It's probably creative writing. So um, I wrote my first, I started writing my first book when I was um, 22. And it took me three years to write, and then another two years spent trying to get an agent, uh, and I was rejected by 115 of them. <laughs> and during that time of massive rejection, I uh, came up with the story of A Flicker in the Dark, which ultimately got me published. So I don't know if you ever really feel like you're a real writer. You just, you just write, and, and you get better with every page, and then every book, and um, eventually, you know, someone will read what you have and, and decide that they want to publish it, so. This person down here. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that the ideas that you put together came to you over several years. Mm -hmm. Now, do you keep uh, notebooks of ideas or do these just go into your brain and then when the time is right, they come to fruition altogether? Unfortunately, they're just, <laughs> they're, they're just bouncing around up here most of the time. But I do have uh, the notes app in my phone is like a very weird peek into my psyche because I've got all kinds of notes jotted down in there. Um, and it's mostly, they're ideas, but they're like observations about 
the world or something I see in the news that I kind of want to find a way to work in there. Um, I'll, I'll jot things down just to make sure I don't forget them, but I've found that anytime I try to make like a real outline, I write it and then I just never look at it again. So it kind of it kind of just lives in my head. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to mention that my name's Isabel Drake, and I live here. <laughs> so that was really interesting to read a book and a little haunting. But um, as a fellow writer, I would like to ask other writers how they combat writer's block and if they have any like special little tips and. Yeah, um, so everyone has their own thing that works for them. So I guess my, my first piece of advice is to, if you find something that, something that works for you, just stick with that, because there's a lot, in writing, I feel like there's a lot of feeling, there's a lot of imposter syndrome and feeling like there's a better way to do it, and I, I still struggle with that, but for me, I can't force myself through writer's block. I've tried, and typically when I go back and reread what I wrote during those times, it's so clunky and bad, I end up just deleting it all anyway. So I do I do a few things. I read a lot, and I typically reread books that have inspired me in the past. So there's a few books that I keep on my bookshelf that I just think are beautifully written, and I'll reread the prologue or like a certain chapter over and over and over again. And just reading someone else's beautiful writing reminds me like, oh yeah, this is what it's supposed to sound like. Um, the other thing is I, I just like get out in nature and go for walks, like just close your computer and walk around and inevitably whatever's, whatever you're stuck on, whether it's like a snag in the plot or a character that you don't know where they're supposed to go or you're just like not feeling motivated to write a certain scene, you're going to think about it while you're walking around and something will, something will click. Um, that's typically what I do. If it's like a couple days, if it's like two or, th two or three or four days, at that point, you kind of need to be like, all right, I just need to like sit at my computer and figure this out. But after a couple days of space, I find it usually helps. Could you share more about your writing process? Do you go write in order? Do you write every day? Do you have characters first or plot first or like a vibes playlist? Yeah. Um, has a story kind of come out for you? Yeah. So I, I'm sure a lot of, have you guys heard of like the plotters versus pantsers? Yeah, most of you have. So it, for those who aren't uh, familiar, uh, there's kind of two camps of writers. There's plotters and pantsers. Plotters are people who meticulously plot um, every, they outline every chapter and they know the full plot before they start writing. A pantser is someone who flies by the seat of their pants and I'm a, a proud pantser myself. Uh, so I, yeah, yeah. so I typically know, I have my big idea. Like I have a, I always have a few story ideas kind of bouncing around and I'm always kind of picking at them and what makes me motivated to sit down and spend the next several years of my life focusing, writing a book, is if I think I have a really good twist. So for me, I have the big idea, and then I come up with the twist, and I know, okay, like if I can tell the story and if I can stick the, the ending, I think it's gonna be really good. And so I sit down to write with a very good idea of my main character, like who she is, what her dilemma is, what her motivations are, what her backstory is, what happened in her history to, to make her the way that she is, and how is that going to be a roadblock for whatever she's working towards in the present. Um, and I know where I need her to end up. Like, I'm at the starting line, and I know where the finishing line is. Everything in between, I just, I just figure out as I go. Um, I think that inevitably leads to, like, my editing process is pretty long. <laughs> I don't do myself any favors because I'm cutting entire chapters and I realize, you know, I thought this character was good, but he's actually bad. And, and uh, But that's how it works for me because I find a lot of the mini reveals that um, are present in my books come to me organically. And so I think that's what makes them surprising because they surprise me <laughs> when I'm writing it. And uh, so yeah, that's that's how I find the writing works best for me, is if I go into it pretty loose. Yes. Oh. I want to go back to that other statement you were making about your inspiration book, mm -hmm. and also what book would you be reading right now? 
Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I am a huge, huge fan of anything that Gillian Flynn writes. Most people know her for Gone Girl, but she also wrote Sharp Objects and Dark Places. And um, she's actually one of the first authors that I, um, that I read that made me realize you can write a really descriptive thriller. It's just all about the pacing because thrillers are so fast paced because you can quick read them very quickly. But if your story is kind of bogged down with a lot of description, that inevitably slows it down. But she's such a master at pacing and dispersing the descriptions in with the action that you can, you can fly through it, but it's still gorgeous. So I love her books. Um, Emma, uh, the Girls by Emma Klein is one of my favorite books to reread. Uh, Megan Abbott is a is a big favorite of mine. Um, Donna Tart I think is incredible. Um, Allison Galen I really love her work. I, Peter Swanson clearly a lot of thriller <laughs> writers, but any anyone who can write a good descriptive thriller is one I enjoy. Oh yes, um, I'm reading right now. I'm reading um, They Come at Night. It's, uh, it's about a assassin, a female assassin. It's pretty good. I'm um, interviewing her uh, at another book festival in two weeks. Her name's Yasmin, and uh, it's, it's great. And I just finished um, Everybody Knows by Jordan Harper, which is also I would highly recommend. It's like a Hollywood crime noir book. It's very good. Um, when you're reading a book especially, you have to – figure out that line between reality and the book that you're reading and especially with like true crime and thriller and stuff like that you want that escape from a book but you also want that aspect of reality that comes with it how do you decide where that comes in in your books and that kind of line between morality reality and fiction yeah that's a good question um, I guess for me the assumption is any any reader who's picking up a book a work of fiction is willing to suspend reality a little bit. Like that's why we read fiction is to escape our real lives. But at the same time, I guess I just write what I enjoy reading. And for me, I like to read something that, you know, fiction is, is real life, but exaggerated to a huge degree. Um, but I want the the reveals in, in the characters to be believable. So I try to root it in reality as much as possible. I guess as an example is um, like for A Flicker in the Dark, my debut for um, those who aren't aware, it's about the daughter of a serial killer. And so that's, that's pretty unusual. Like that's not a reality that most people can identify with, but there are people out there who that they've lived that. And so I read, you know, books and articles from, um, written by the daughter of Dennis Rader, the BTK serial killer. And I listened to a podcast called Happy Face, which was narrated by the daughter of a serial killer. So I try to take like real emotions and thoughts and feelings from people who have been through certain scenarios that I'm writing about. But then of course you have to, you have to inject twists and drama to make it interesting. So I guess to answer your question, uh, I try to make the characters as real as possible. The situations that they're in, I'll, I'll, I'll make them a little more unbelievable if I need to. <laughs> I was drawn to a flicker in the dark because it was set in Baton Rouge, mm -hmm. and I'm from the outside of Baton Rouge, and now I live in Savannah. Oh, so you know it, it's. Anyway, how did you choose Baton Rouge for your setting in, for Flicker in the Dark? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So I, I try to be pretty intentional with my settings because I love writing about place. And I also want my setting to serve as kind of a character in the story itself. So I mentioned Savannah I chose because it's haunted and it kind of mirrors how Isabel is haunted. Um, a Flicker in the Dark deals a lot with um, the idea of evil kind of hiding in plain sight and you don't really know where it is and you can be in a very happy loving family but there's something terrible right there and, and you never saw it and um i thought that something about the bayou and like the swamps was very uh, symbolic of that it's a gorgeous place but there's danger lurking everywhere and you, you can't really see it it's camouflaged really well so i wanted to set it in louisiana um and then i came across a little town called bro bridge which is the crawfish capital of the world, as I'm sure you know. And first of all, I loved that alliteration. It was so Louisiana, and I just liked the way it sounded. 
Um, but I also, they have a crawfish festival every year and I was researching it and looking at pictures of it and I saw um, there's a, a scene set at the crawfish festival in the book and I don't know how to explain it other than that scene just like popped into my head and I really wanted to write that scene. <laughs> so that's why I chose Bro Bridge and then um, Baton Rouge was sort of a logistical decision. She needed to be, as an adult, um, still in the state of Louisiana, within driving distance, a bigger city uh, where she could you know, run a thriving practice, th things like that. Since we're talking about a flicker in the dark, I know it was optional for TV or film. Are you getting any input into that process and how is that going? Uh, I, I get very little input <laughs> and updates. So yeah, it was optioned about three years ago. And the way these things work is they, they kind of get, get picked up and dropped and picked up and dropped and put on ice. So as of right now, I don't, I don't really know where it stands, unfortunately. But um, I don't know, maybe one day it'll, be, it'll turn into something. We'll see. <laughs> Hi, um, going back to your writing process, how did you keep yourself motivated when trying to find an agent and putting yourself out Where there? Where is this question coming from? Oh, there you are. Okay. Oh, you're right in the glare of the light. I was like, yeah. Where are you? okay. Can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Um, going back to your writing process and trying to get published for the first time, how did you keep yourself motivated and putting yourself out there with your work when you kept getting so many rejections? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's tough. It's really tough because as any writer, I'm sure, knows, your biggest fear is pouring your heart, heart and soul into something and letting someone reading it, reading it and then having them not like it. And that happened to me 115 times. And so at the end of the day, I think eventually every rejection hurts a little bit less because as you continue to rack them up, you're just like, all right. Like, they're just reading is very subjective and not every book is for every person and at the end of the day when you're trying to find an agent you just need to find one person who really really connects with what you have to say and it's a numbers game and I think a lot of people give up at that stage which is unfortunate because you're they're not even really giving themselves a real shot at it um, so I just tried to stay motivated by reading uh, rejection stories from other authors I mean Stephen King was rejected so many times. Every author that you read has been rejected so many times. And I would read those stories and think like, okay, if it happened to them and look at them now, it's just kind of what you have to slog through to get there. Um, and I just, uh, I, lo I just love doing this. And it was one of those things where I, I thought to myself, even if I never get published, I'm gonna be spending my weekends writing stories anyway, because it's what I like to do. So why not keep doing it and, and keep trying and see where see if it'll ever go anywhere. So I wanted to ask about life of an author on tour. Have you been successful doing Carry On Only? Because I'm a member of the Carry On Only fan club and I shared my tips with you on Twitter. Thank you, you saved my life. That, yeah, I, I was successful, probably thanks to you, yeah. I was just on an 11 day tour and I was, I was really, really wanting to do a carry-on only because I, when you go on tour, you're going, you're in a new city every day, and I didn't want to check a bag every day, so I did 11 days in a carry-on, and it was great. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank Hi. you so much. You're wonderful. Um, how do you keep track of your submissions, keeping track of all of the logistics that come with writing? You know, all of the super fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so when you say submissions, just to make sure I understand, do you mean like agent when I was trying to find an agent and stuff? Yes. Yeah, okay. So for that, um, basically what I did when I was trying to find an agent was I Googled literary agencies and I made an Excel sheet of every literary agency and then you pick one agent per agency who seems to want what you have. And there's a lot of, they almost always have bios on the website. Um, or if you go to like publishersmarketplace.com, they'll write what they're looking for. And I picked one agent per agency. I put um, their name, their contact information, their submission criteria in like a personalized query. So for example, the query that ultimately landed my agent went something along the lines of like, I've written this book about, um, 
the daughter of a serial killer. It's set in uh, the swamps of Louisiana, and I think you would be interested in it because you mentioned you like uh, psychological thrillers with a um, unique sense of place. You're interested in true crime, and you represent Megan Abbott and Greg Isles, who also write descriptive thriller, thrillers set in the South. So, like, personalize it to them to a, a startling degree. And then um, I queried all of them, and I would mark the date that I queried them in the Excel sheet. I would mark what their typical response time is. It can be anywhere from like three to, you know, four weeks, six months. Um, and if that response time lapsed, I would nudge once, turn the cell from clear to like r kind of pink sort of. And then if they just never got back to me or they rejected me, I would mark it red and then go to the next one. So this poor Excel sheet is like bleeding red. It's, <laughs> it's all red. <laughs> but that's how I kept track of it because it's, it's a lot of stuff. But it was helpful for me, so I hope that helps. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So. so again, thank you to Stacy, um, and thank you for joining us. Please remember as you go out, Thanks, Stacey. We're, we're trying to fundraise to keep this festival Saturday free, so please be as generous as possible. Thank you for joining us.